In 1977, a KLM jumbo jet was standing on a runway on Tenerife Airport. In the cockpit, the pressure was mounting. The crew had been waiting for quite a while, and fatigue and impatience was kicking in. The airport was extremely busy. There was bad weather, air traffic control systems didn't really work well, and the visibility was very poor. And as a result, the crew did not know that there was another plane standing on the same runway from which the KLM jet wanted to take off. Only the junior flight engineer was aware of that. Yet his warnings were dismissed by the captain due to seniority and hierarchy. Not only was the captain in the upper ranks of the KLM organization, he also taught the junior flight engineer how to fly. And as a result, the warnings of the junior flight engineer were dismissed quite easily and did not really influence the decision of the captain to take off. And just before the wheels of the KLM plane lifted from the runway, it crashed into another plane, that same plane that was still standing there, a Pan Am jet, and it caused one of the major aviation disasters in history, causing an enormous amount of casualties. Exposed analysis revealed that this terrible accident was caused by a combination of structural and human factors. And following this <clears throat> analysis, interaction measures were taken to influence the interactions within the cockpit, thereby trying to diminish the influence of behavioral impediments, such as hierarchy and seniority. Now, the inclusion of the human factor really marked the beginning of an era of the culture of aviation safety. Now, when the financial crisis hit the world in 2008, economic analysis was initially dominant. And two of my colleagues wondered why the human factor was so demonstrably absent. And they started thinking about a way how to integrate behavior into our supervisory methodology into how the perspective on behavior and culture could contribute to realizing our organizational objectives, being enhancing the financial strength of financial firms. And now, a couple of years later, and still after continuous development of our methodology, it is still based on three very simple ideas. The first one is, is that behavior drives performance. And the second idea is that many organizational problems often have the same identical behavioral root cause. And the third idea was, if we are able to integrate this behavioral perspective in, in supervision, we might be able to better prevent and maybe also solve problems. Now the question is, how do we get more grip on behavioral patterns through supervision? The answer is, we perform a lot of examinations. We try to identify behavioral patterns, mostly in the top of the organization, and we try to figure out what the effects of these patterns are. And to do this, we have designed several instruments. One of them is the instrument called board effectiveness. We look at boards and we try to get a grip on their behavioral patterns. So we look, for example, at leadership styles. Is there a dominant CEO neglecting the input of others? Or is leadership style much more facilitative in the sense that it encourages others to participate in discussions and bring their perspectives forward? But we also look at whether or not institutions are capable of successfully transforming their business model, their organization, or their culture. For adapting to new circumstances is vital for sustained performance. And for this we use our instrument which we call change effectiveness. In our risk culture assessments, we look at how traders deal with the uh, difficult relationship between reward and risk. We want to know their personal values, and we want to know their personal mindset. And we also look at how the culture of the group might impact their pers personal decision making. Now, let me emphasize that we are not normative in our approach. We do not prescribe how to behave under all circumstances. Nor do we work with checklists with predefined criteria for good and bad behavior, because what works in one situation might be very counterproductive in another one. 
We expect, however, boards to reflect on their own behavior, to see what the impact of that behavior is, and to adjust that patterns if necessary. And we do not work under the assumption either that there is only one superior culture. Each culture may have its virtues, yet also its own risks. And as a supervisor, we want to identify these risks, and we want institutions to eliminate them. And in spite of this all, we do not have a totally neutral view on culture. In our opinion, behavior must always contribute to prudent management or ethical behavior. And when we see that institutions take excessive risks or display unethical behavior, we will use our powers to fight against that. Let me now give you some examples of what we have encountered in the supervision of behavior and culture. What we often see is that boards do not really challenge proposals, that they do not really discuss risks or alternative options. As a result, decisions are often taken without proper scrutiny, causing damage to the institution and its customers. Now, this may have various reasons. There may be structural reasons. For example, that the rules and roles and responsibility between the decision makers are diffuse or that insufficient information reaches the board so that it has to decide on the basis of incomplete information. But there are also a lot of behavioral reasons for this insufficient challenge at board level. First of all, there may be a very ambitious growth strategy. And this may create a mindset in which the aim for profit is the dominant aim. And not that in this mindset risks are unimportant, However, they are not as, as important as making a profit. This does not only manifest itself at board level. Entire organizations may suffer from the pressure of overly ambitious strategies. Now, dominant leadership might be another reason for insufficient challenge at board level, because it may frighten others to speak up and to share their perspective. But not only dominant leadership styles may have its vices, also, other leadership styles may create problems. For example, laissez-faire leadership styles. Laissez-faire leadership styles causes urgent decisions to be postponed and creates room for interpersonal conflict. And this may result in indecisiveness or even uh, distorted cooperation. Now, insufficient challenge may not only be the cause of those who lead, also those who follow may create problems. Followers may be subject, for example, to a strain for consensus. They assume very easily the position that is held by the majority of the group, even, even when they know that that position is wrong. Yet the fear of being scorned by the group prevents them from bringing in their own opinion. Other supervisory findings that we have relate to the way institutions are dealing with change and firms encounter many obstacles in dealing with change. One of them is making insufficiently clear what they actually expect from managers and employees in a new situation, in terms of new behavior. As a result, change is often superficial and is not really um, completed until the end. And another obstacle for effective change is that top echelons, the, the board, delegates the responsibility for the change to lower levels within the organization. Now, that may be perceived as a signal that this change is not important at all. So, in the end, the result might be that the change effort is not really credible and that it's not really finished. Now, how do we perform the supervision of behavior and culture? These were the findings, but how do we get these findings? We use a combination of traditional instruments combined with innovative approaches. We gather information through desk research and interviews. We hold multiple interviews at board level as well as at the levels immediately below to see what the behavioral patterns at these levels are. But we also perform board observations, and which is a rather new approach. We sit in at board meetings to observe the dynamics within the group as a fly on the wall, so to speak. And it's obvious that it's a bit awkward for these directors that we are there. They are not used to us being there. But it is our experience 
that our presence becomes quite normal after 15 minutes. And it's our experience that board meetings resume their natural course. Another very important element in the supervision of behavior and culture is trust. For if there is no trust between a supervisor and those whom we supervise, nobody is willing to share his or her experiences, his personal experiences with a supervisor or reflect on their own behavior. And we try to start building trust by extensively explaining what we will be doing, that we will not put them on the sofa to dig into their past, but we, that we will look at behavioral patterns at the level of the group. So not the individual level, but the group level. And furthermore, we try to build trust by explaining that we will not punish them if something goes wrong. It's about, for us, it's about creating lasting change, not so much about enforcement. And furthermore, we try to build trust by rendering objective and verifiable judgments. And for this, we need specific expertise. We built a multidisciplinary team, not only including governance specialists or change management specialists, but also trained organizational psychologists for being able to observe group dynamics and to have neutral, objective and respectful discussions about it is an art in itself. And finally, we try to build trust by demonstrating that we are also willing to challenge ourselves, that we are open to the comments of others and that we are really willing to listen. Now, when we started the supervision of behavior and culture a couple of years ago, I had no idea that one day I would be so committed to it than I am today. And I ask myself quite often why this, is, why this is nevertheless the case. And the reason actually is quite simple. When people are under pressure or when they feel threatened, they often lose their authentic way of doing things. They do not see others as equal partners, but often only as obstacles to realizing their goals. Through the supervision of behavior and culture, I hope to contribute to cooperation within financial institutions and to introduce and to restore a bit of humanness in financial organizations. For I'm convinced that meeting others as equals in these constructive decision-making processes not only contributes to better decisions, but also contributes to respect, cooperation and mutual trust. Now, summing up in four points. Behavior drives performance. Two, problems within organizations often have the same behavioral root cause. And three, as a supervisor, it is possible to identify behavioral patterns and to influence institutions to do something about it. And a final comment, that's the fourth point. It's not that this type of supervision is a magic pill and that cures, automatically cures all ills. It is not so. It is crucial that we combine this behavioral perspective with a structural perspective that is also very present, of course, in financial supervision. It is effective not in isolation, but only in combination. And the reason for that is simple, because two is always stronger than one. Thank you.